everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. I am your returning co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me is my returning co-host, Michael Walker. How are you doing, Walker? Fantastic, Mark. And how are you this week? Well, you know, I was enthusiastic to talk about games, but then you opened your mouth, and then suddenly all desire just fled my body like some rat from a sinking ship. Wow. It's a whole thing. Wow. But we're going to soldier on, and do you know why? We do it for the love of the game, Walker, and we do it for the love of our listeners. I'm going to cry. Why, Walker? Has your enthusiasm left you? I wonder why. You made me sad. Walker, let's try to be professional here about this. <laughs> Follow my example. First, we're going to talk about the as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment, The Aurus. Then we're going to talk about the games we've played over the course of the past two weeks. Then we're going to talk about some more games. And then after that, there's going to be some more games that we played. And then just to round it out, we're going to finish up with the games we've played over the course of the past two weeks. And then there's going to be some news and why it doesn't matter. There's not going to be a topic or a feature review because there's no time. No time. No time. So many games. So many games. Walker, why don't you start with what we reviewed last year? So exactly one year ago, we played a game called Rift Force, which is a very interesting card game uh, where you pick a bunch of different factions and you sort of blend the decks together. And it's very fast moving. You're putting cards into lanes. You're sort of uh, locked down into, like, if you're playing cards and you have to put it into, like, three tight lanes. Otherwise, you're doing other stuff. I haven't got back to it. It was lent out. I haven't got it back yet. There was an expansion that came out. All sorts of exciting stuff. Have you not tried the expansion? We did. You okay. picked it up and we had tried it. Yes. The expansion is Rift Force Beyond. Moved to pick up the expansion because we're both pretty enthusiastic about Rift Force. I don't think it's at the absolute tippity top tier of the two-player card battlers, but it is very good. And we've uh, happily played it since reviewing it. I remain catastrophically inept at Rift Force. I don't think I've ever come close to winning a single game. It's on Board Game Arena as well, so if you want to give it a try. Is the expansion on Board Game Arena? Not the last time I checked. Okay. Rift Force is very clever. Enjoyed it every time I play it. Very quick. The asymmetry is uh, not quite as radical as a lot of other asymmetric games. You know, the, the bar for asymmetry <laughs> post-root has definitely been increased, but it is nonetheless uh, quite enjoyable. And I, although the new factions and beyond aren't necessarily some of my favorites. The solo mode is surprisingly good. So, Rift Force is a very nice card game. And that is the game we reviewed exactly one year ago. Designed by Carlo Bortolini and published by One More Time Games. So, now on to the games we played last week. Walker, what did you play last week? Mark, we got to pl play Septima. This is the newest Mind Clash game that came out. This is designed by Robin Hegedus. And it is about sort of witches taking care of a community, hopefully not getting caught or t bringing too much attention to themselves and, and getting a match put into their soul. Like hot foot is they, what they used to call it in the olden days. First rule of medieval medical care, DGT, don't get caught. Don't get caught. So you're, I don't even want to say moving because you're not, you don't really move that much. And it seemed, <laughs> it seemed like a whole bunch of busy work. Yeah. And on, and on top of the fact that you don't move that much, they give you free moves all the time. So it makes movement even that much more arbitrary. Yes. So you're going around, you're collecting all of these ingredients, you're making potions, and you're making two kinds of potions. You're making potions that are going to heal people, and you're making potions that are going to help you. And in doing so, you're you're getting points and you have so many rounds and then you're, you're trying to feed people into the city council because they're, <laughs> they're going to catch somebody. We're using feed in the figurative sense here, not in the literal sense. This is not a soylent green situation. Because there's going to witch that's going to get caught and they're going to go on trial. So you're sort of like uh, sneaking people in on the jury and or, you know, people that could influence other people. And then you vote. And then if you get the witch off, they come into your sort of coven and then they give you benefits that help you at end game scoring stuff. It was an interesting game. I found that there was a significant distance between the premise and the actual execution of Septima because there's this board situation of you having to worry about taking care of villagers and not getting caught. There's this action selection, which theoretically offers it. Uh, op interesting opportunities for collusion, but the collusion is just too straightforward. You just say, I'm going to play this card. You should play this card. It's like, okay, I'll play this card. Okay, that's the collusion. And then there's the p political element of trying to acquit these witches. I, uh, I was very optimistic 
about it all coming together in a coherent way, because that is one of the things that I look for in medium heavy and heavier Euro games. And it is one of the things that Mind Clash games reliably have had that a lot of other heavy games have not. And I didn't find the mechanical and thematic promise to be realized in the actual gameplay of Septima. Now, this is one of those cases where the actions were actually too quick for their own good, because you mentioned busy work. I, I have to agree. The actions that you perform are very simple and straightforward, and that's to the good. But then the problem is they're layered on top of this round structure that is surprisingly more cumbersome than it ought to be, given what you're actually doing. And then when it comes to the voting part, it was just odd. We, had, we were playing at three-player, and Huey decided to emphasize more early game, and therefore... We were always tying, but he got in there first, so I never got any new witches to my coven. It's true. And then late game, you decided to concentrate on it, and therefore I was then again up against someone that we tied a couple times, and you got in there first, and I didn't get any witches. So the whole game- Also true. I didn't get any new witches. <laughs> yeah, and that I think highlights some of the problem with the potion generation. So you said you can either make potions for yourself, those are called utility potions, or you can make curative potions to cure the villagers. And again, thematically speaking, curing the villagers ought to take center stage. Now, there's reason to go cure the villagers, sure, but I often found that it made a lot more sense to just load up on utility potions that then allow you to stack the jury. Because every time you brew a utility potion, you just get points right away. As opposed to curing the villagers, which is a typically a two-stage process. First, you brew the potions, and then you actually have to deliver the potions in a different action. As opposed to the utility potions, which you can just use whenever. And so it's much more straightforward, liberated me to go do other things, and you pocket the points right away. It's not It's not a complicated thing. Now, this could just be inexpert play of Septima, and people who know what they're doing might make a much, much better job of curing things. But the other consequence of trying to focus on the curing game is there's there, you have to compete with the other people. You run out of sick people. There weren't enough sick people to make enough curing actions. And so by the time you got going, by the time you look around near the late part of any of the four rounds of Septima, you'd be like, okay, so there's nobody sick. Huey, has stacked, has stacked, Huey or me has stacked the jury. What's left? And the answer is no, not a whole heck of a lot. Now, to be perfectly clear, we do not play with the expansion. We have the deluxe version of Septum. It has the expansion built in. And by the way, I would like to stress that of all the Mind Clash games I've played, the deluxe version here is as unnecessary and as superfluous as the deluxe version of Cerebria. Cerebria, I think you're fine with the retail edition 100%. Same thing here with Septima. I mean, we're talking about literally, you know, cardboard tokens instead of wood and things like that. It's like not, not, a, not a thing. Not, not really an issue. And we also didn't play the expert game because, like a fool, comma, Walker, I believed the rulebook. The rulebook is, rulebooks are escalating their game of lies, right? So for it's being controlling. <laughs> yes, the micromanaging the micromanagement has gotten more sophisticated and more explicit and more emphatic because the rule book I'm sure you've all seen this people, right? It's like, well, for your first few few plays, we recommend you leave the asymmetric powers in the box because your little feeble brain's like, forget it. But here I believed them because specifically this was a mind clash game. Presumably they know their audience, and it specifically says like, look, even if you're used, it, it was very clear. It basically said, Mark, Mark, don't do it, Mark. Don't do it in your first play, Mark. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. If it's going to speak to me directly that way, I won't. It was a mistake because, as I say specifically, the upkeep to gameplay ratio was way too high and we ran out of things to do effectively. And consequently, I would have liked another sideboard of things to go and play with, which is what the expert game adds. It adds spells that you can go muck around and things. So... Were we to play again, we would absolutely, I think, jump to the quote-unquote expert game. And possibly then it gets more interesting? I don't know. Yep. I'm willing to give it another try. Yeah, I wasn't, like, completely bored or terribly unengaged. I was mostly just disappointed. Given the publisher's history, given the promise of the game, given how, if everything had come together in Septima, I think it could have been really special, both in terms of thematic integration as well as mechanical integration, and it just didn't. Yeah, cycling, it's just, I was very much just cycling through potions because it was like, oh, gather ingredients? You don't really need to because there's actions that let you brew potions missing yeah. half the ingredients. So you just 
which further made the board position irrelevant. Yes. Yeah. Like, if, you, if there was actually pressure to be in certain parts of the board at certain times to get the things you needed to do to make the potions, and then you needed to be in a certain place so as to go cure specific villagers and layer on top of that a vague uh, a, a pseudo-political element, that sounds like a winner. Instead, there were all these weird ways that the that those fundamental tensions were defeated by the game's own systems, and that was very disappointing. Septima by Robin Hegedus and Mind Clash Games. Walker showed me White Castle, not a game about burgers. Very confusing. I'm not and, the only and, one. And disappointing. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, White Castle is by the same design team that did Red Cathedral, Israel Sendrero and Sheila Santos, published by DeVere Games. Very much like other DeVere Games games, the box is just the right size, which is excellent. Some people have difficulty getting the components back into, into the box. I say to them, you probably want bigger bags. Bigger bags will often solve these problems. I'm not saying there's tons of room. There's just enough room. White Castle has a in, an interesting action element whereby the board is seated with a whole bunch of different actions available depending on what dice you draft. There are these very charming cardboard bridges upon which you place the dice. I was very charmed by them. And on top of that, there's this sort of pseudo build your own engine aspect whereby sometimes if you draft the lowest available die, you get to run an, an, a progressively increasing series of resource production elements. What I found strange in White Castle, and Walker assures me that this is not a, a, a necessary feature of the system, but was rather an artifact of our given play, was that there's a certain kind of resource called the Daimyo token, which powers a lot of the available bonus actions. It's more or less like you can go do an action that's relatively straightforward, like get a small Benny, and then if you have a daimyo, act, a daimyo token, you can spend the Daimyo token and then do one of the core point-generating actions. As it happened, there were practically no places to go get Daimyo tokens, with the exception of the built-in one on the game board, which takes more or less your entire turn which more or less defeats the purpose of doing a bonus action, right? If I if I spend one turn setting up a bonus action and then the next turn cashing it in, I could have just gone and done the action in the first place. And the one exception was Walker's built-in engine. This is not a claim about imbalance. This is a claim about interest. This is a claim about flexibility. Walker's built-in engine, which w was the only reliable source of Daimyo tokens, and consequently, I just ignored much of the map because it wasn't in my interest. You know, they're the things that get you points, and you can do those more efficiently if you've got Daimyo tokens, and if you don't, you go and do the less interesting version, which is fine. That, I mean, you can build a game around that. You don't have to have bonus actions. But when there is a bonus action, and you seed the board with all these bonus actions, and I, like, okay, I could do this once or twice over the course of the game, fine. It, it, it made me feel like I was strangely interacting with only a subset of White Castle. Does that make any sense to you? Nope. 100%. We did go through the decks. We missed out almost all of the rooms that, that uh, produced Damio tokens, yeah. which was unfortunate. And also the the guard bonuses didn't produce them and the gardener bonuses didn't produce them. We yep. just, bad draw. Yeah, yeah. The board setup was, was I, I'm perfectly willing to believe that had there been one or two other, albeit possibly expensive ways. It, the system doesn't require that many daimyo tokens to work in a way that I think would be more pleasing. I would have been perfectly happy with maybe even two more such tokens over the course of the game, maybe even possibly one. And I'm not saying I would have wanted it to be handed to me, but just a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more grist for the mill, as it were. True, and on top of being able to do the, the nicer bonus actions, there's a track along the top, and in order to pass certain thresholds, you also have to spend Damio tokens. I forgot so, about that detail. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, I bumped so, up against that many times. Yeah, it was, it was rough. It was just unusual. It, it, it leads me to be strangely skeptical of the variable setup, if the variable setup can produce such a state. It wasn't, look, I enjoyed the play. White Castle was enjoyable. I liked the dice drafting. The way you build up your economic line is 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 reasonably interesting. The actions themselves are not particularly compelling, but that's fine. And I'd be interested in trying again because it's very quick. Uh, we're talking about you know a seventy-five minute euro with a with a lot of the same engagement that you would find in a a much much longer game. And I think with experience, I, we could bring it down to possibly even sixty minutes. And that's that's really good. That's very efficient in terms of you know getting the full taste of a resource management uh, dice drafting game. Yeah, much like Red Cathedral, a ton of game 
in a little bit of time in a little time box. And I much preferred the scoring to uh, in White Castle than to Red Cathedral. I felt that Red Cathedral was a little bit disjointed. Uh, you know, the majority bonuses felt a little strange and a little tacked on. Uh, but it nonetheless bears some of the hallmarks of Isra C and Sheila S, namely interesting things with dice, an interesting way of managing resources based on the values of the dice. And it does a good job of making it so that you're not left at the mercy of what you've rolled. You know, you know, standard Euro cleverness in terms of leveraging those little chance cubes. And so I'd, I'd be very interested to try White Castle again, especially if we had a different board set up and or, I don't even know if this is a good idea, possibly exercising some degree of editorial or authorial control over a random board setup. But I don't know. Maybe that would be uh, uh, putting your thumb on the scale a little bit too much. Tough to say. So that was White Castle by Isra C. and Sheila S., published by Devere Games. Devere Games is definitely making a reputation if for the size of their boxes, if nothing else. Now for a plethora of dexterity games, because this Saturday we streamed at 1230 like we usually do, and we played a ton of dexterity games, and even Mark and I, out of the stream, played a bunch of dexterity games. We will start with Paku Paku, designed by Antoine Boza and put out by Ravensburger. Mark? Yes. I was promised things. You were promised? With Paku Paku. There was a Paku promise? There was there was expectations yes. set. Yes. And I'd like to say they delivered on all fronts. Paku Paku is so good. Paku Paku is so good. <laughs> there is, there, it's fast. It's it's deadly. It, it, it doesn't outlive its welcome. It. it there's funny moments. There, there's all there's, sorts of things. It, it, it's the kind controversy. of- Controversy. Contra- <laughs> all sorts of things. <laughs> Surprisingly, though, I will point out all of the things that in the abstract you might get worried about. Sometimes you read rule books and you start wondering, ooh, I wonder how that's going to shake out. Is that going to get ambiguous or difficult? I get this way whenever we start reading about communication restrictions as a general rule. And the thing that I was concerned about with Paku Paku, it's a real-time dice rolling dexterity game. And one of the key triggers in Paku Paku is how many dice you have in front of you. But one of the dice results allows you to pass. I was concerned that there'll be some shenanigans over. No, 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 I was in the middle of passing, and it's halfway between my hand. No, I have yet to, yet to experience any serious controversy there. The only controversy I had in my playings, so I'd, I'd like to hear more about your controversy, because I played it as well, was there was some controversy over who was responsible for the tower to fall, causing the tower to fall. There was a controversy between two people, and so I, we just put it to the put it to the table to vote. Now, I'd just like to point out, I didn't specify that you could only vote on the two people that were accused, because one of the people who was accused just voted for me for no reason, <laughs> even though I wasn't even involved, which I thought was clever. I, I, I can't even dispute the, the cleverness of that move, but Paku Paku is fabulous. I only have one serious beef with it, and I will wait to hear about your controversy first. Oh, they, they, I, don't, I don't feel like it was a controversy. <laughs> there, there is, like, like you just said, there is a dice roll. There, are, there is either the green happy face, which will let you pass the dice to the next player in clockwise order, or there is a, a red symbol for stacking the dishes or numbers that don't matter until you have to score some points. So when you roll the red dishes, it means you have to take a dish that is different from the dish that's already in the pile and stack it on top. Well, not from the pile, from the previous from, one in the pile. Yeah, from yeah. The, yeah from Given the, that there's only three types, the, the fourth person to stack a dish doesn't just stare at the, the, the stack. And, there, and there's no rules about timing. No, there you are no rules about that. Sit back and wait and say, "Oh, is everyone done placing your dishes?" No. Is it is it my turn to place my dish? No. You roll a red symbol. You place a dish. If yes. the other people are too slow, yes, then that's their own fault. It's it's true. This is my dish. Okay. I'm putting it on the pile. Okay. Specifically, I would just like to say that <laughs> I have heard reports from other people at the table that. Walker big leagued them while they were in the process of placing a dish. I base I wasn't there. All right, and there is video evidence. I should probably go check the videotape. But my understanding is is that the claim was that they were in the process of maybe sometime like shepherding the dish towards the stack. I don't think you have any claim over the stack at that point. I agree. Yeah. No, we're on the same page. I, I'm with you on this one. I'm. I, I will absolutely back you. Now, the one thing I don't enjoy about Paku Paku. And this is a minor gripe, but I think it it bears mentioning. It is themed about an overeating panda eating lots of rice. Fine, whatever. It is also sprinkled, the rule book is sprinkled with little fake Confucian sayings. That I'm also okay with. Whatever. Because they're, they're, they're openly acknowledged as being fake. And they're irreverent. Paku Paku is named after a Japanese onomatopoeia. 
I get a little ooked out when people, especially Europeans and their descendants, start lumping together Japanese and Chinese traditions or Korean or Thai or whatever under the gloss of Asia. I'm not a fan of that. It's pretty Orientalist. I think they could have done a better job. If they wanted to call it Paku Paku, they could have easily made it some sort of Japanese overeating animal eating lots of rice. That would have been fine too. If they wanted to name it, they could have named it. Like, so yeah. I would have been happier if they had not decided to just gloss over a lot of different Asian traditions. But that having been said, Antoine Boza is a designer with a very diverse and varied catalog. The moment I heard about the premise of Paku Paku, I, I thought I would love it, and I do. It's marvelous. Paku Paku. Speaking of, of Japanese game, we got to play a game called Niko Jima. And this is putting up giant power poles of three different colors of all different sizes and also hanging cats from the wires. I'm, I didn't know that there was a big problem about cats hanging from electrical wires, but apparently it, it's, it's a thing. Hanging cats sounds uh, a little violent. Let's just say they're dangling from the, dangling. the power lines. All right. So you have this large wooden disc in the middle of the table and it's sectioned off in four equal pie plate sections. And what you do is you roll a couple of dice and it'll tell you what two colors have to be joined by these uh, two poles. And then you draw a cube out of the bag and that'll tell you the color of the wire that you're to use. And then you look at the pile of all the different types of poles in that particular color. You choose your poles and then you have to place one in one color and one in the other. It can go on top of existing poles or through or under just as long as while you're placing, you're not touching any of the wires. And when you're all done, you have to say, okay, I'm ready to verify, you know, none of the wires can be out of the disc or touching other wires or anything like that. For people who find it a little bit difficult to visualize this, imagine heavily asymmetric nunchaku. Uh, and I don't say that just because it's a japanese theme game. It's, that's what it is. There are two sticks that are joined by a cord. And you place out the sticks and the cord is joined them. And you quickly end up with a very, very, very dense network. Because the disc upon which you're placing all these poles is not very large at all. And it's a game very much like uh, cockroach poker. There's one loser. Everyone else wins. And the loser is there's no confusion. In all the games that we've played so far, <laughs> when there is a failure, it is catastrophic. It it, it collapses the entire A structure. catastrophe even. A catastrophe even, yes. And so how you get the cats out is when you draw a cube to figure out which wire you're going to, you might draw a black cube. And then you pass that black cube to someone and when it becomes their turn, they are to hang a cat from the color of wire that they just put out. And that could add to some some tippiness of the poles. Who knows? I personally was simultaneously impressed and a little chagrined by how quickly Nekojima escalated. There's no early game in Nekojima. <laughs> it's pretty much, you know, the first placement's easy, sometimes even the second placement. But then I found by the third and fourth placement, you're already in the late game <laughs> because it's very difficult to find room with all of these dangling wires everywhere and nothing can touch anything else. And there's just not enough real estate to manage any kind of placement. Now, I would much rather that than a dexterity game that takes too long to get going. For example, Rhino Hero Super Battle, which is one of my favorite dexterity games, and definitely one of my favorite Haba games, does take a little bit too long to get going. You know, the early stages are, are take a while, and you only get an interesting structure after a, a, a number of turns. Nekojima doesn't have that problem. That having been said, it's... <laughs> You're right. The ending is catastrophic, and sooner than you might imagine. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm, I'm very conflicted about Nekojima. I was expected to enjoy it more than I... I was expecting to enjoy it more than I did. I was a little bit disappointed, but this was, again, a, a function of managing expectations. It also wasn't as cute as I was expecting it to be. It's a game about cats. I mean, come on. It was less cute even than Calico, and Calico doesn't really have any cats in it. It's true. I still really love it. I'm quibbling, though. <laughs> it, it, it looks great as well on the table. Yeah. Kind of does. See, here's the thing. It looks almost like a gigamic game. You know those gigamic games with all the wood and these 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 interesting abstract structures? It looks more like that, but it doesn't have interesting different, you know, tones of wood and the clean structures that you would find in that, nor do you have something that's aggressively cute like you would have in a dexterity game like Yuri or a Penguin or Crash Octopus. 
These are all true facts. It's true. I, I, I think I'm just, I don't know. I think I'm just being too harsh on Nekajima. I don't know what, what was going on, but it, I didn't take to it as much as I thought I would. I'd, I'd happily play it again, though. I mean, geez, it takes like five minutes. Just so. And speaking of games that look great on the table, also got to play Catch the Moon. This is designed by Fabian Raffold and Juan Rodriguez and put out by Cosmos. And what this is, is you have some a few straight ladders and they're wedged into this plastic cloud at the beginning. From then on, you have all these weirdly shaped ladders that you are now sort of putting in and creating this weirdly spider-like conglomerate clump <laughs> of ladders. You roll a die and either you have to touch one ladder with the ladder you're about to place, or you have to touch two ladders or you roll the moon and the ladder you place must be the highest ladder either touching one or two ladders and almost instantly you've got this crazy looking structure that is both foundationally you could build a home on it or a skyscraper <laughs> but you would not because it is death <laughs> catch the moon is very solid i'm i'm a large fan of catch the moon it is very visually interesting how you're building this weird the weird structure. The structure evolves over the course of the game. I've yet to play a game of Catch the Moon where there wasn't a substantial shift without a collapse. And even then, the collapses tend to be very localized. You know, very frequently, not necessarily as spectacularly as Nekojima, but very often in dexterity games, the moment something falls, that's usually about it. But Catch the Moon, just the physicality of the design means that you can have several collapses while still having an interesting structure and possibly sometimes, though not always, still having a vaguely competitive game. Again, I, I talk frequently. I don't really care about competition too much when it comes to board games, but all things being equal, I would rather the victory conditions be good. Catch the Moon isn't the greatest, but it's, it's, it's okay. And uh, as, as you say, the unique components that are a joy to manipulate, they lead to interesting visual structures. Catch the Moon is, a, is, is, is definitely a spectacle. It's the kind of game that you're playing and a lot of people will, you'll catch the attention of a lot of people as well as catching the aforementioned moon. And there's a gigantic version. There's well, also a gigantic version. version, yes. Yeah, we had this interesting structure. You'll see it if you watch the stream where it went like far left and there's like just nothing under the whole structure as we built it. <laughs> very weird. Just went up right outside the base? That's right, yeah. Interesting. Immediately wanted to my great left. And that is Catch the Moon. <laughs> Not a dexterity game, but kind of close. We played Team 3. Team... Th Mark, we yes. played Team 3 Green. Yes, we played Team 3. We played the Green Edition because I brought it along with Paku Paku, and I figured that we could go all green all the time, as Chris Tucker would say on the criminally underrated The Fifth Element, Super Green. Because there's also a Team 3 Pink, just there's so also, people know. There's all, Look, we wouldn't want people to get confused. Exactly. Especially also as we are a Gibbon-owned and operated enterprise, we thought that the Simeon theme, more on Simeons later, would appeal. Team 3 is uh, was recommended to me in the context of our raving about Jenga Maker. One of the problems with Jenga Maker is that it is pretty inflexible in terms of player count. You pretty much want to play it with four. And Team 3 is much more flexible. You only need, you need a minimum of three, pl uh, three players, but then you can scale up uh, probably not as high as the box wants you to, but I, I could easily see you scaling up pretty well. And the way that it works is you have a structure that the team needs to build. It's a purely cooperative game. The structure doesn't look like anything, so that's a knock on it as compared to Jenga Maker. Only one person gets to see the structure, but they are not allowed to speak. They may only gesture. Another player is allowed to speak, but they can't see what the structure is, and they're not allowed to manipulate any of the pieces. And then finally, the, the only player who's allowed to manipulate the pieces cannot see. So the first player needs to communicate with gestures what, what pieces to pick up and how to manipulate them. But not gestures towards the pieces. They're not allowed to point to pieces, but they're allowed to make any other gesture they wish to make. And then the second player has to verbalize those instructions, and then the third player has to then attempt to execute the instructions. It was tense and brutally difficult. We completed one structure. <laughs> Close on the others. Uh, Some of the others. Yeah, that's being generous, I think. <laughs> it It's a fascinating design. Uh, again, it has the problem that you have to have people who are comfortable operating with their eyes closed. Again, that's that's not something that I would spring on strangers, for example, and to, you know tell them in a public space to just keep your eyes closed. That's not an ideal thing uh, in terms of just social comfort. And I, it really does tax a variety of different kinds of skills. I mean, Jenga Maker already requires you to verbalize things that are not easily verbalized. 
But Team 3 just ups that up to 11. It's very difficult, and I found it very interesting. Uh, the, the, uh, other people at the table, like Huey and you, seem to find it in, somewhat aggravatingly tense. Is that a fair characterization? Well, it's, it's, it was at the beginning. It was sort of like figuring out how the communication was going to transpire, I mm-hmm. guess. It's like, how how is this going to start? And we're there was a little confusion on how that was going to happen. I see. I, I think the salient, I've already mentioned this, the salient advantage of Team 3 over Jenkamaker is its flexibility in terms of player count. Other than that, I think Jenkamaker is the superior product. The key comparison is it's, you know, a, a team-based or cooperative game whereby someone is giving instructions about how to build a structure. And it, the expansions make it even harder. And I, I'd be I'd be very interested to try it again just to see if there's any kind of skill that could be accumulated <laughs> so as to get better than absolutely terribly awful in terms of our ability to execute, not in terms of the design. But my enthusiasm seemed to be the greatest of everyone at the table, so who's to say? Got to show people Piazza Rabatza. This is designed by Gundo Hoffman and Jean-Pierre Sizzleman, put out by Zoc Games, so it's hard to sort of explain what this is. So picture of grid, sort of like a an organizer, all these different sort of squares that are made from locking together straight pieces of cardboard. Well, imagine a, a, a hashtag. Hashtag. A hashtag yeah. made by intersecting pieces of cardboard. Over and over until there's about a grid of four by four, say. And then in the center of this is this giant winding toy that's... <laughs> That's sort of, I don't want to say it's off center, but it's weighted in a way that when it starts spinning, it shakes this whole structure in a crazy way. So you have this small, small village in Italy that is gyrating. And then to that, there's magnets embedded in different places around this grid. Then you take this little plastic red scooter that is attached by this flat ruler and they've raised that whole structure so you can sort of scoot this, scoot the scooter mark. Yeah. You scoot the scooter. Is that what they it, call that? I, I think so. Okay. And it, and it zoom, and you can make it zoom through all the different doorways and roads and around the village. And you get to set this metal pizza on the scooter. And then you come close to the wall and it attracts the pizza and it locks to the side of the wall. And you've delivered that pizza and or someone has stolen the pizza. Yes. Well, the pizza, the pizza done got delivered. The only question is whether that was the person who ordered the pizza. <laughs> it's a wonderfully charming little toy that that makes me laugh. And I love it. I'm disappointed that I didn't get to play it again. I saw that it had been on the table. I only played it the once. I'm a big fan of Piazza Rabatza. I would really like to try it again. I think it's a little longer than it wants to be. Oh, I, I once again curated, yes. much like Catacombs, curated the experience to what it should be. Yes, because normally you just play through such that the piles get exhausted. Yes. Yeah, and so you can just easily just call which, the, the which piles. Which is painful. In. It was everyone's going to get two turns, and who can deliver the most pizzas in two turns? I don't know about two turns. Well, okay. Cle- well, clearly well, there's a golden mean true, to be no, found here. Well, remember, we were, we were cycling through you know, six different dexterity games on a stream. Sure. If you were to play it, then yes, you'd be like maybe three or four turns and how many pieces can you deliver? Right, right. Yeah, Pietro Batza is a marvelous toy. It's got great table presence. It's very difficult. (laughs) But it's the kind of, it's, it's the great kind of difficult you often find in hobbyist dexterity games where you can start to figure out how the thing works and navigate the physicality of the components and you can see progress over the course of, of a single play. I'm a fan of that. All right. Now to finish off the dexterity games, we have Tumbling Dice. This is designed by Carrie Grayson, Randy Nash, and Rick Sold. And it is a very family-friendly type game. It's like a shuffleboard, downward, downward sloping staircase where you're going to be flicking or throwing dice. And depending on what face they land on and how far down you get down the staircase, they're going to be worth more points. Not a lot to it. Fun things because you knock, you know, knock other people's dice over. It goes very quickly. I enjoy it. I'm not a huge fan of Tumbling Dice. I just... <laughs> At, at the point where, again, this is me talking about victory conditions and dexterity games. At the point where the truly impressive skill shot lands on a one and so is worth less than the person who just plopped a six somewhere down <laughs> higher up on the staircase. True, but you might mm. have knocked someone six off maybe at the same time and then the difference in the score. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It just I, I don't feel like it impress it rewards the truly impressive shots. 
And that just makes me dis- vaguely disappointed and unsettled. It, it's also very expensive, very difficult to, to transport. Uh, and also, I'm terrible at it. Possibly the last thing is influencing more uh, my, my opinions about Tumbling Dice than the others. But, uh, mm. Yeah, it was like, if you watch, even if you watch the stream, you'll see where I got, we were going to do three or four rounds. And my score in the first round was so high, it was just me being silly for the next three rounds while they tried to catch up and never did. <laughs> well, you're just, okay. You are just very good at Tumbling Dice, independently of all those considerations. Uh, no, it's not, I think this time was just luck. Okay, yeah. This, so sometimes normally, yes. <laughs> this time, not so much. <laughs> there is a fair amount of luck in tumbling dice, but generally, on top of that, you are exceptionally skilled. Based on my recollection of having seen you play tumbling dice, is that does that round out the dexterity games, Walker? It does. On to more Simeon news. We played After Us. After Us is a deck building game by Florian Sirieux, Catch Up Games. It is about a post apocalyptic world where. Simians, I'm going to have to keep using this word, have inherited the earth. We actually engage in a, a protracted digression because the English rule book operates on a, uh, calls them all apes, even though it involves tamarins and mandrills, which are both monkeys. And I think that what they ought to have done right from the start is have starting cards be tamarin monkeys or any other kind of monkeys or a variety of different kinds of monkeys. And then all the upgraded cards be apes. So what you do is you kick out the mandrills and you replace them with obviously the greatest ape in existence. The Gibbon. But they didn't do that. Fine. Whatever. They're going to have the chimps. Everyone loses their minds over the chimps. Fine. Gorillas, because you got to have gorillas. That's, that's an obvious inclusion, and I have no quibbles about that. And the chimp. Okay, fine. Chimpanzee. And then the mandrel, which isn't even an ape. It's just a monkey. It's just a fancy painted monkey. You could have even had a baboon. Whatever. Anyway, the reason why it confusingly in the rule book just talks about them as apes collectively, and you actually discovered this initially, was because... I trolled... Board game geek? No, no, no. There was the... <laughs> no, that was a manifestation of oh, the, of gotcha, the search. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. You, you ultimately discovered that in French they're all singe because it's all simian. Correct. Singe is both ape and monkey, and it was originally published in French, and that's why we think we came to it. Anyway, setting all that aside. So yes, instead of they should have translated into simian, instead they translate into ape, and yes. then it gets into confusing things that things that are not apes. Yeah, because it seems like a minor thing, and it is a minor thing. But yes. honestly, if you're going to theme a game run around that, you might as well spend the five necessary seconds to be terminologically consistent, because it, it can actually ca- it caused us a little bit of confusion. Now, half the time we were just trolling and, and, and making fun of the game as we were playing it, but part of it actually was a, a tiny bit of confusion, because like, okay, they keep talking about apes. Does that is that a meaningful distinction? Because I know that some of these cards aren't apes, so it could have been easily cleared up, and they didn't. That's a little bit of sloppiness that I think that arbitrarily themed euros should seek to avoid. Yeah. So after us is a very heads down deck building game. You are drawing four cards and you put them face up, and there's three lines of boxes, either half boxes that are lean off the side of the cards or full boxes that are on the cards. And so you're trying to arrange these four cards in a way that will maximize what you want to do with them. Cause you're going to run the lines, you know, left to right first, second and third lines, and they're going to generate resources. And then you spend the resources, and then you generate more resources Then you spend a bunch of resources and you get some more cards and then it's the next turn. Yeah, so the right side of card A might have a cost associated with it, and the left side of card B might have a benefit associated with it. And if you line them up next to each other, you spend the resources on A to get the benefit on B. If you haven't lined it up, then those half boxes don't do anything. I go into detail about this because that more or less exhausts the choices available in After Us. Yeah, that, that is the game. It's 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 almost like a throwback to the early days of deck building where there weren't really a lot of choices. Now, remember, there, there were the early days of deck building where you didn't really have many... You, you just had your purchasing decisions. That was about it. Everything else kind of ran itself for quite a while. We've kind of moved past that. You know, Core Worlds, Mage Knight, those are some of the transitional deck building games. are like, yeah, you can make decisions about what to do with your hand. I think Shadow Rift was one of the first that I played where I really felt like I was making decisions about what I was doing with my hand independently of just purchasing decisions. Here, in After, uh, After Us, you're not really making purchasing decisions because the purchases are blind. You don't really know what you're getting. Now, on the one hand, I think this is a good idea because otherwise you might be tempted to go through the the entirety of your deck thinking, okay, what boxes do I have where? Because it's very hard to just sort of intuit what your deck looks like at any given time and after us. It's just, you have your four cards, you arrange them. That's it. That's your decision space. You're done. That's, that, that, that's what's going on. 
And so I was pretty unimpressed with the amount of, of actual game there was in After Us, to be frank. So they have the different decks of monkeys, and each monkey sort of specializes in something. Simeons, Walker. Simeons. So you'll be able to sort of sort of know what you're going to get off the top of the deck. You know, this. We have a general idea. Mandrills these, produce energy. And yeah, these ones are good at batteries. These ones are good at victory points. These ones are good at culling your deck. And then it has this interesting thing at the end of that round where everyone picks a sort of special ability, and you flip up, and you can spend some resources to do the abilities of the person to your left or right. You say abilities, it's just, it's just a resource. Just You get a little extra resource from the thing you pick. And that also determines what deck you'll be purchasing from. Again, I say deck because you don't see what card you're purchasing. You don't have a, a choice or a t- display or a tableau. And the cards are sufficiently expensive. I'd be interested to hear your, your opinion. When I was playing After Us, I never really had much of a choice. There were seldom rounds where I had enough resources to, to choose between two different decks. So I was like, okay, I have enough to buy a Mandrill. I guess I'll play the quote-unquote action that lets me buy from the Mandrill deck. All right. So again, I, I really felt like I was making vanishingly few choices in After Us. Well, it... I found the discussion about what constitutes an ape vastly more interesting than the game, and I don't even find zoology that interesting. Maybe with another play, you might focus on, on manipulating your cards in a way that you'll get the resource that you want, so you could buy the card that you want, or or, you know, making the deck in a way that 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 would happen, I'm, I'm not sure. Or start saving resources, I, I'm not sure. Maybe, I, I maybe really, the saving really, resources. I really wanted more out of yeah. After Us. It really went a, long, it went a little too long yeah. for what we were doing. It's true. I think if it ended maybe four turns sooner, I would have liked it even more because it would be like, okay, that was interesting, let's try it again. Quickly. It's also a weird throwback <laughs> throwback isn't even the right term because one of the things it's that a, has... It's al- an odd digression. Yeah, that has almost always characterized deck builders is variety of available cards. Even going back to the OG Dominion, there's always been a large set of different cards. You can figure out, okay, well, how do these different cards interact with each other? Can we get a different setup with a different tableau? And is that going to lead the game to be different? No, no, no. You always play with the same card sets and they're randomized. So it's you don't even get the same effect that you do in, say, a game of Shards of Infinity. Like You might say, oh, well, in Shards of Infinity, you only ever have one deck or any of the Realms games from, from Wise Wizard. But at least there, you only see a subset of the available cards and they do different things. Ultimately, it's just a mess of boxes that you're just lining up. And so, okay, well, this is a Mandrill, so instead of spending a blue resource and an orange resource to get two of this widget, I instead get two batteries instead of two Rage or whatever. Eh. I had one interesting thing was the one where you had, if you had three different simians in your lineup, then you'd get a benefit and you wouldn't have to spend anything to get it. Kind of interesting. True. And again, that, 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 but, but even then that undermined the one area of after us where you're making choices, because at that point it's just a function of what you've already purchased anyway. So it's true. After us. Now we'll take a quick break to pay some bills and we're back. Walker, what else did you play last week? Mark, I got to play an interesting game called Raising Robots. This is designed by Brett Sobel, Seth Van Orden, and put out by Navu Games. And we were talking earlier about, uh, you know, a rule book. You know, that that this is an advanced game, Mark. Let me tell you, you know, four or five times on the Kickstarter page, it had the warning, this is an advanced game. In their partial defense, I remember talking about this in Pledge of Indifference. The art and the overall visual presentation of Raising Robots definitely communicates a game at the weight of, say, quirky circuits. So I could definitely understand why they would want to communicate. It's like, this is cutesy, but dense. I really enjoyed it. I showed Mark the deck of robots. It's this giant, at least... 7,000 cards. Yeah, at least 7,000. Minimum 7,000. All of them are different. All of them are very interesting, weird, creepy-looking robots. And they all have a name fantastic lots of character lots of character in the game so i'm going to try to explain it to you it might be difficult there are six different actions you can take in rising robots and you have a card for each of these actions it's a little bit like race for the galaxy feeling so you've got for, my attention the first thing you're going to do is you have eight energy cards because you're going to be drawing two a turn so there's sort of two phases of the game so there's like like four turns, you get two cards each, and then you get all your energy back, and then four more turns with two energy eight each. Okay. And then the game will be over. So you flip up two energy cards, 
They could be like two energy, four energy, whatever. Then you look through your hand of six actions and you place two of these actions face down underneath those two energy cards. And then everyone flips them up at the same time. And those are the two actions that you're going to be able to get to do this turn. And you're going to be able to get them at that energy level that you put them under. Other things that might happen is that there might be little cube symbols on those energy cards. And over on the main board, you're going to put those energy cubes on that action that's associated with that card. And that will allow anyone to take that action, but only at the power level that there are cubes there. And if someone took an action that added cubes to an action that you took, you'll be able to add that more energy to that action, if that makes any sense. I have confidence it makes sense to someone. And then and then as you cycle through the actions, you start much like, you know, Race uh, race for the Galaxy, you start at one action, you cycle through them, uh, you'll have an opportunity to add some battery power to increase the action, the energy you're going to use for that action. Actions do all sorts of different things. They let you build robots. They let you uh, uh, remove all of these different uh, power-ups that are all over your board that make the actions better, that you can place on the robots that will make them better. So the first uh, three actions are sort of utility actions, doing stuff. And then you start doing uh, the sort of robot line actions. They normally get you resources, but after you get the resources for that action, you get to run that whole line of robots, much like a wingspan type action. So as long as you have enough energy in that action, you get to start doing all these different abilities that the robots have. And then it's just a bunch of point generation and, you know, making your board better and, you know, just improving your, your board state. Is so, so it's a tableau builder with a clever action selection. Mechanism. Very much so. I'm very much looking forward to a, hoping, hopefully showing it to you and B, just playing it again. I really did enjoy it. It is very interesting and fun little game. Well, the robots are very charming. I'd be happy to take a look at it. That is Raising Robots. Played a game called Moonrakers. Moonrakers is a semi-cooperative-ish deal-making deck building game about mercenary space pilots accomplishing contracts. And if all those things sound interesting, then maybe you'll enjoy Moonrakers because I did not. Moon <laughs> Again, this was a running theme this week. I didn't feel like the theme was manifested any kind of promise because I, I don't know, mercenary space pilots doing contracts. Great. I mean, old, I remember fond memories of the old privateer games and so but in, in Moonrakers, all of the sort of contracts are out on the table. Yes. And you sort of try to make deals with everyone at the table to go on those missions. So how did that part of the game manifest itself? Badly. In, in comparison to the one that we <laughs> attempted. Badly. Because there's not enough friction in terms of the deal making. Sometimes there's too much. So by friction, I mean the ability to go and make deals, right? In, imagine a resource game where the resources are so tight, no one ever has a surplus, right? That means there's too much friction and you're not going to be making deals. I have played deal-making games like this. This often happens, for example, in Catan, where there's too much friction because, say, wool has not been generated for turn on turn. Nobody can make a deal. There's not enough not enough resources in the system, right? Too much friction. Moonrakers has the opposite problem. There's not enough friction because you going on a mission with somebody often, almost invariably, carries zero cost. And so you have all these people volunteering to go on the mission for, for peanuts. Very often, actually, it made sense for someone to offer to go on a mission for nothing because they had it was in their interest to go do it because just, of exogenous resource reasons. Just to cycle their cards, right? Or even just to cycle their cards because it doesn't even cost you cards or tempo because if you go on a mission, you're going to wipe your hand anyway. The only time where I felt that there was any friction for a deal was once I wasn't inclined to go help somebody because I had a really good hand and wanted to hold out for a better contract. That was it. All the other time you look at it, it's like, oh, well, I, I, I happily do this for a dollar. The number of people who jumped on a contract for a dollar, it was the overwhelming majority of the time. And indeed, in a negotiating context, there's no reason for a single person to hold out because they're not going to be able to move the market by themselves. And besides, they'd probably be happy to do it for a dollar themselves anyway. So why would they want to shoot themselves in the foot to make a more interesting game state for the sake of it? Now, the way the contracts work is they might say, okay, well, this is worth some, some number of points, 
and some number of dollars, which can then be distributed amongst the various people that you have to make the deal to determine who gets what. And it requires you generating a certain total of symbols across all the people who join the mission. And then you get into the actual card play. And it's, again, a throwback to the old style of deck builders where you don't make any decisions about card play because you get one action. Some cards give you more actions. You play those first. <laughs> and then there are some cards that give you more cards. You play those if you have enough actions. And that's it. And so the the quickly... The game, the game of Moonrakers was so, it was structurally fascinating in one way, because there was the early game where practically none of the contracts were achievable. There was about one or two rounds of the mid game, and then suddenly you blinked and you were in the end game where every contract was almost trivial. It was so strange. And during all this time, I didn't really feel like there was any interesting negotiation going on. There wasn't any interesting card play. You get a whole bunch of toys and bennies, but mostly they're just like, every time you go to contract, you just generate more symbols. Okay, fine. That's fine. You, There's a currency-based system that is unlike deck builders in that you accumulate currency from round to round and then you spend them. You have to generate more currency by going on missions. You don't generate currency by playing cards. So I, I don't think that it leveraged the deal-making well. I don't think that Moonraker is leveraged deck building very well, and I don't think it leveraged the theme very well. And at the end of the day, I was just waiting for the game to end. It was just turn after turn of, well, I think I could go on this contract. Almost everyone jumps in, and then everyone gets their bennies and go home. goes home, and that was that was about it. I I did not enjoy Moonrakers. It was pretty. The graphic design is, is really interesting, and they definitely know how to put together a, a, a Kickstarter package. Uh, Moonrakers was... Uh, published by I uh, by IV or Four Studio, which is, has a uh, game design as uh, arm as well as other kinds of graphic design and visual arts related arms, and I definitely could understand that uh, that that pedigree given how everything was put together. But uh, I found Moonrakers was similarly an unengaging, decision light, not particularly interesting deck builder. That's unfortunate. It is unfortunate. Moonrakers was designed by Max Anderson, Zach Dixon, and Austin Harrison, published by Ivy Studio in 2020, pursuant to a successful crowdfunding campaign. There have been a number of expansions. They went through another crowdfunding campaign. We talked about it in the context of Pledge of Indifference. And at the time, uh, I realized that I didn't have any exposure to the base game, so I sought out exposure to the base game. And uh, yeah, that's Moonrakers. I got to get put Great Western Trail New Zealand back onto the table. This is designed by Alexander Pfister and put out by Eggerspiel and is very more similar to Great Western Trail the original than the Argentina game was, except now you're doing sheep. And the major part is that, you know, midway through your journey through, you know, selling all the sheep at the end is that you get to shear them all as well. And then there's this boat system at the top and it leans much more heavily into deck building your you're accumulating all these different cards that come into your deck that you can play and then immediately draw again. So it's not as really bogged down your deck. So it, it infuses the system with more money and more resources and just gives you an all round, more interesting playing experience. I still stand by it. It's still the, my favorite of all three so far. Great Western Trail, New Zealand. Still looking forward to trying it. Walker, fun fact. Oink Games, Japanese publisher of those delightful small box games. Did you know that they have published games in larger boxes? No. Yes. They published a game called Tiger and Dragon, designed by Hashimoto Atsushi, in a box that could best be described as small, but by the standards of Oink Games, it is massive. <laughs> in comparison to their normal offerings, it is the equivalent of an Oink Games coffin box. And this is because it has chunky tiles, vaguely reminiscent in shape and size, although not quite, as you might find in a Mahjong set, for example. And I mention this in part because it is, you know, vaguely... Asian-themed in terms of mythology because there's a tiger and dragon. And in this case, unlike in the case of Antoine Bozan Paku Paku, this at least is consistent and actually comes from Asia. So there you go. It is kind of sort of a climbing game. It's also kind of sort of a trick-taking game. It, it's a hand-shedding game where you have these tiles and they range from one to nine. And in the deck, there are a number of copies as is the number. So there's one, one, two, twos, three, threes, etc. And the goal is to get rid of all your hand of tiles. And if you do that, you get points and nobody else gets anything. 
the, that scoring element was probably one of the aspects that I didn't appreciate as much in Tiger and Dragon. I much prefer it if after a given round there's, you know, a second place award or something. Eh, not not my preferred style, but nonetheless, I can forgive it in this particular case. It was very, very simple. The way it works is you play a tile, and the only way that anybody else can match that tile is by playing an exact copy. So if I play a six, you can't beat it with a seven. You have to play another six. If nobody plays it, I get to play another tile as a bonus and play another tile to lead the next round anyway. So it is in your interest to be able to play unopposed tiles. Consequently, that leads to the only actual decision points in Tiger and Dragon. You might not want to block everything you can block because a given tile, if it could either be used to block or to be played as an unblockable lead, you absolutely want it to be the unblockable lead instead, right? This is particularly relevant for the lower numbers, like a two or a three. So if somebody plays a two, you might want to let them take it, knowing that your two is then almost unanswerable. The exception is the, the aforementioned Tigers and Dragons. Uh, they just they get to match a lot of different uh, tiles, so they're good on defense, but anything can match them, so they're very bad on offense. Extremely simple. Very, very straightforward, extremely luck-driven, but very pleasant in a tactile and visual way, not completely absent in decision-making. So in other words, very solidly in the Oink Games oeuvre. So if you, if you like those kinds of Oink Games, then I absolutely think the Tiger and Dragon will please you as well. It's very difficult to track down, but a lot of people order directly from Oink Games anyway. I thought it was fine. It was a, a perfectly pleasant diversion. Not exactly the deepest thing in the world. I would much rather play something like Scout in terms of a shedding game, because the, the tempo considerations in Scout, I think, are vastly more interesting, and I think it, it's also uh, better in that it is the traditional Oink Games box size. Just so. We got to get Mosaic, a story of civilization, back to the table. This is designed by Glenn Drover, and it is a review copy that we were given by Forbidden Games. This is specifically with the expansion Wars and Disasters, which we purchased our own damn selves. So in the expansion, we've added some boats that are worth a little bit stronger. We've added some, what do they call them, calamities? Disasters. Disasters. So there's disasters. It's, the, it's literally in the name of the expansion. Added to uh, a lot of the decks and a lot more cards. Yes. And the deck seemed a lot more bloated. I, the, it was the same size, though. It was. It, because you, you remove a whole bunch of the cards. The, the card size remains the same. It just seemed to drag on near the end. So I think that has less to do with the expansion and more just to, to do with the way the endgame triggers get shuffled into the decks. Because in Mosaic, whether you play with the base game or the advanced game, with the with the expansion that is, they just get shuffled into the bottom pile. And it just so happened that in two of the decks where those endgame triggers were, it was either the last card or the second to last card. I think it was just another Dewey failure. I think Dewey didn't shovel them very well. I think no. that's the problem. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you that this was by far the longest game of Mosaic we've ever played. That having been said, I was surprised, at least personally, this is one of those things where it's just... I knew I was enthusiastic about Mosaic, but apparently I'm also enthusiastic about Mosaic, even when it's vastly longer than it's been in the past. So there's that, at least. I don't know if you had the same reaction. Apparently not. No. No, nah, it's too bad. Yeah, the, the expansion elements are uh, not particularly compelling, I don't think. There is an effort, I think, in the expansion to address some of the criticisms of the base game. That is entirely reasonable in the context of expansion design. However, a lot of the criticisms of Mosaic were people wanting Mosaic to feel more like other Civ games, which is to say they wanted there to be more of a Troops on a Map type flavor on what is basically a game in the same vein as Terraforming Mars, which is to say a largely multiplayer solitaire uh, tableau builder, I do think that there's slightly more player interaction and competition in terms of the area majority scoring of Mosaic than there is in Terraforming Mars, but nonetheless, same rough ballpark in terms of things. I don't think that that shift is one that Mosaic should try to attempt. I think it was trying to answer the wrong question in terms of those additional gameplay elements. Speaking personally, what I feel like I got out of the expansion was a very, very, very expensive group of new cards. And some wonders. Those I'm perfectly happy with, because it's just more mosaic, more more variety in terms of the text, and all the other military elements, specifically the boats, the national military powers, the optional military actions. Eh, those all things being equal, I probably would just leave in the box. Agreed. Now, it is worth noting that now we can finally get the same rhyming convention that we had 
uh, that, that I, we had desired in the early days. This is, after all, by the same designer and publisher of Lizard Wizard and Raccoon Tycoon. And so now I can talk about either the expanded game of Mosaic or the prosaic Mosaic or the archaic Mosaic. That pleases me greatly. And I was able... Look, I, I enjoyed the new cards. I enjoyed the aspects, you know, the, the relatively light but nonetheless salient aspects of player interaction. I guess I'll rely on one of my traditional cards, uh, Cavalry Tactics. This is not to be confused, of course, with Cavalry Tactics. Some people assert that there's no difference. And if that's the hill they want to die on, that's up to them. And I, I really like Mosaic. I just... Every time I sit down to play Mosaic, I thoroughly enjoy it. And yeah, going back to what I said before... I felt its length. I knew that it was lasting way longer than previous games. Again, you know, when you have a random endgame trigger, that might happen sometimes. But I was still feeling it. And I, I, I did feel that we were losing some other people at the table, though. So I think we've discovered that my enthusiasm for Mosaic is higher than that of other people. In its defense, the expansion is modular. So I am going to be leaving out some of the additional modules because they... As I said, they don't play to Mosaic strengths. It's trying to take Mosaic in a direction that it shouldn't go. And for what it's worth, I don't think it will satisfy the people that want Mosaic to be a troops on a map game anyway. So a lot of the design energy, I think, was fundamentally misbegotten. A natural reaction to market forces, but I think ultimately trying to answer a question that should not have been asked. But I'm happy to have extra cards, even though I felt like at the end of the day, I grossly overpaid for them. And that is Mosaic, specifically the Wars and Disasters expansion. Got to play another game of Ready, Set, Bet. Ready, Set, Bet is the real-time horse betting game by John D. Clare. It boasts a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of flexibility in terms of player count. It does require either a screen of an app large enough that everyone can see it and hear it, or someone who runs the game as game master. That is a bit of a downside, but some people can really get into that role and, you know, the kind of patter that you might expect from a dealer or a croupier or announcer or what have you. And given that, uh, it's I, I don't know why Ready, Set, Bet doesn't click with me. I really like real-time games. I like some horse betting games. Uh, I... Uh, Long shot, the dice game is okay. I don't like it as much as everybody else, but I, I vastly prefer that. My favorite is still Winter Circle, which is the redevelopment of Royal Turf by Reiner Knizia. And ultimately, I think it's just that it it forces you to... The, the, the time pressure forces you to make arbitrary decisions. And so, yeah, I feel the tension, and everyone's like... You get to see as a, as a sort of market force the sort of irrationality of crowds. Someone starts betting heavily on a horse, and that encourages everyone else to make irrational bets on that same horse. I think I'd much rather prefer as a spectator to watch people playing Ready, Set, Bet than actually playing it. There seems almost invariably to be this protracted period near the end of the race where everyone's done all their bets, and we're just waiting for the dice to tell us who won. And that ends up being far more determinative than anything else. So... Ultimately, I feel that the pacing is a little bit off, the tension is misapplied, and it, it, it doesn't grab me. To be fair, nothing that John D. Clare has designed has really grabbed me. I enjoy Rolling Heights, I think it's fine, but ultimately I think his catalog is an uneven one at best, and I'm, I'm not shocked given the design pedigree that I'm not really engaged by Ready, Set, Bet, but I am somewhat surprised given the overall format. Got a lot of good buzz. I enjoyed my one plane, but yes, the uh, upkeep was a little painful. You need the right setup. You need, a, as I say, a large enough screen that everyone can see it or someone who's willing to run the game as Game Master, which is not ideal, especially for a light party game. That is Ready, Set, Bet by John D. Clare, published by AEG last year. So there's some rumblings, Mark. You rumblings. Know, whining, maybe. Okay. About fairy tale. <laughs> what about it? Well, they didn't like the fact that it was pulled off the cannon due, yep. to, due to lack of play, so they said that we should play it. So we did. We did. Got fairy tale back to the table. And it was as good as Fairy Tale always was. It's great. Fairy Tale's great. Fairy Tale's a great game. Yeah. It, it is, is designed by Soshi Nakamura and put out by everyone. Yes, it's had many editions. Z Man Games is the big one. I enjoy my copy, and there's also copies that have, you know, uh, like one card chain. You know, there's a few extra cards thrown in there that do weird things. And Yes. A, a, a little mini expansion in some of the editions. I think your expansion has the mini mini expansion. No, I don't have the little egg things. Oh, you don't have the little egg things. My mistake. Yeah, they all use the same art. Uh, the iconography has been changed rather substantially back and forth several times over the editions, which I find very confusing. And we played a three-player game, 
And playing playing a three player game is always a bit dicey because look, I love Fairy Tale. It's one of the best pure drafting games there is, and as as far as time commitment goes, it's it's absolutely a, a fabulous filler. Uh, it is very frequently the case, though, that what determines your success or failure has less to do with clever drafting decisions and more, are you going to get to that in the deck or not? <laughs> because a lot of the deck will end up being unplayable and undrafted by the end of the game. And if those were the cards you really needed to score, oh well. I wonder if we just threw it at, we might have, we should have thrown out a dummy hand, maybe. Well, I was there, so there was a dummy hand. Yikes. I think once I did it, you just have an extra hand go around and then you just pull out a, ra- a card at random when it's their turn to draft and then you just have it going around in the cycle. I see. It, it seemed to work out fine. Interesting. And that was Fairy Tale by Z-Man Games. Got to try Hollywood 1947. This is the latest game from Facade Games. They publish games in lovely little magnetic clasped things that look like books. Very charming packaging, very small box, very lovely art design, and I thoroughly disliked the actual game. This is my first experience with the publisher. I've had in- a lot of people have recommended various games to me from Facade Games, uh, particularly Tortuga and Salem, and then an equal number of people have said, "Stay away, you're not going to like them." And it turns out that the latter group was probably correct. <laughs> if Hollywood 1947 is anything to go by, it is nominally a social deduction game. And I can uh, primarily describe my lack of enthusiasm about it by virtue of two facts about Hollywood 1947. Number one, the aspect that replaces, you know, voting people out or refusing to send people on missions or voting to, to, to hang people on suspicion of being a werewolf. What replaces that is a random die that determines whether or not you get to play a card. A substantial part of the game of Hollywood 1947 was various people trying to get into the game and failing because they kept rolling badly. No. No thank you. Also, in this game, the communists, a.k.a. the bad guys, won. I was one of the communists, and I'll be darned if I could point to anything I did that contributed to anything. (laughs) It just seemed like, on top of the fact that the die randomly, the dice randomly tell some people you don't get to play these rounds, round after round after round, and your entire action is to try to get back in, but failing because the dice doesn't come, up, the die doesn't come up properly. Oh my! I, I can't point to anything clever or, or interesting that either of the communists did to win. It was just we got a good luck from the flop. We got good luck in terms of the card draws of other people, and there you go. And even if we had been identified as being suspicious, there was might have been very little they could have done to keep us out of the contributions because, again, the die system. Now, I'd also like to point out something about the theme. The theming of Hollywood 1947 is a little awkward. Were there communist, and by which I mean Stalinist, like agents of the USSR, infiltrating various elements of American government and media in the late 40s and 50s and even later? Yes. Is that fact overshadowed by the tremendously authoritarian reactionary witch hunt led by a variety of politicians for demagogic and dangerous and harmful purposes. 100%. So, is there a story to tell about ferreting out secret communist influence in various agencies and aspects of American society? Yes. Should you tell that story? Only very carefully and with a very, very deft hand. Hollywood 1947... It's a very light game, and so it just doesn't have enough of that context. And so you're playing with fire and not giving yourself the space to really elaborate. And so it leads you feeling kind of ooky. It's it's weird. I... (laughs) I don't know why they chose this in this way. I mean, I mean, honestly, especially when it comes to Hollywood, because a lot of the focus on trying to get communists out of Hollywood was mostly just a mask for anti-Semitism hysteria. So I, I don't, I don't know what I'm left with. Like it, it's, it's really strange in terms of an editorial choice. If it had been a good social deduction game, I would have felt conflicted, as I did with Secret Hitler for some time. But it's not a good social deduction game, and so I don't feel conflicted. <laughs> that was not Hollywood 1947 by Travis Hancock, published by Facade Games. Uh, just a quick, we are still playing My Island. We are now halfway through, or a little bit over halfway through. We did a little 12, 13, 14, and it is still interesting in a way. It's getting a little, In a way? It's getting a little samey. Really? You know, placing tiles, you know, they throw in. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Which is, I was hoping 
for the seal hunt it's portion like, of the instead game. Instead of oh, <laughs> instead of this sticker, there's that sticker. Instead of the Buka Buka sticker, there's a Him Lickler sticker. And yeah, so it's all mostly all the same thing, just different, you know, facades of stickers. That's fair. That's I'm fair. hoping hoping some other stuff will come. We did get some no, I can't even say that. But anyway, <laughs> I'm sure. still willing to go along for the ride, but... I, I feel that where we're currently at is a game state where every tile placement is agonizing because of the simple-to-intuit t- uh, uh, scoring conditions, but that are impossible to satisfy equally with every placement. And so I'm perfectly happy with where the game state is at, and I'm also happy with the subtle ways in which the game state has evolved. My one problem with the overall structure, which may or may not be true of other groups, is that very often, the most difficult rules to internalize aren't the complicated ones, but the ones that are subtly different from other ones. You know, you find this often in systems, right? It's like, oh, wait, is this the undaunted where this happens, or is this the undaunted where the other thing happens? Uh, undaunted is just an example of a system with, with very light rules, but sometimes it's those corner cases you can't remember after you've played your fourth or fifth version of undaunted which I'm always happy to do. Similarly, in my island, you're getting those iterations almost every episode. And so frequently people go, wait, wait, do do I get points for that? It's like, no, 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 that was three games ago. That doesn't apply anymore. So even though every time, I mean, part of the problem is no one pays any attention to me, but every time you can say like, this is the total story of scoring conditions. Like, uh, wait, are we still scoring for this? Like, no, that was last week. But so my enthusiasm seems higher than that of yours. That's unfortunate. But we'll, if, if, if after the next chapter you want to call it a day, we'll still have gotten uh, 18 games out of the sucker. So that, that that's still pretty impressive. But I, I, for one, am keen to keep going. That is My Island by Reiner Knizia, published by Cosmos. We also got a game called Daybreak, designed by Matt Leacock and Matteo Metpasse, put out by CYMK Games. And it is very much in the vein of a pandemic type game. Is it? It does. It just feels that way where there's constant pressure coming in over and over again. And, and you're sort of, you know, flailing around trying to help each other get through particular crises that are popping up. To me, it feels very much like a cooperative Terraforming Mars. It does. And I think that's part of the, the specific design end. But, you know, you've got these tags, you've got these cards that are powered with tags. And so you tuck cards with those tags behind the, the, the other cards. So you do an action that's boosted now. And I think that's for both good and ill. It's good in that you have some pretty interesting projects that are based on real world science. That's another way in which it's similar to Terraforming Mars. It's good in that you have a variety of trade-offs to do with what, what to do with those cards. It's bad in that it feels far more multi, multiplayer solitaire than, say, Pandemic. Pandemic, you've got this shared board of problems, and that's the entirety of the problems that you're facing. In Daybreak, a lot of the challenge is just managing your own tableau and managing your own board. It's the case that it's often hard to get everyone on the same page to point out, again, the shared struggles, the, the the limited ways in which you can share resources, the limited ways in which you can play cards to benefit other people. That's that's the minority of the time. And that actually is my my chief criticism of Daybreak so far. It's that sensation. It's true. There's a couple of crises where anyone can tuck cards under it. So I guess you're sort of helping each other at that way. But like you said, some people start with the ability to be able to share cards. Some cards come up that let you, let you do that. But like you said, Overall, it's more of a solitaire type of experience, but I still very much enjoy it. It's also on Board Game Arena, so you can always give it a try there, too. Yeah, I really, so far, my early experience with with the Board Game Arena implementation, I'm not a fan of. It really emphasizes, uh, well, not emphasizes, it, it, it exacerbates the communication difficulties of getting everyone on the same page. Like, hey, 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 could, could, could we deal with that global crisis? And everyone's like, I've got to manage my tableau. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, ooh, certainly, certainly nothing that you did to me in the last turn of our shared game online. I am very pleased with the way that Daybreak seeks to model climate change. You know, very much like Pandemic, it's a game where you're trying to save the world. Pandemic didn't really feel a whole lot like public health in any way. You know, you had these cubes, and they were disease cubes, and you had to go go deal with them. Uh, and indeed, the way that Pandemic Fall of Rome changed them to invading armies made perfect sense because it was an abstract threat that was just metastasizing in various ways. Daybreak, however, is very, very much themed around climate change and presents grappling with climate change in, despite the fact that it's a very light game, in a 
I think, relatively nuanced way because it presents it as a geopolitical problem as well as an economic problem as well as a scientific problem. One in which you have to deal with government structures and regulation. One in which you have to deal with cultural standards. One in which you have to deal with energy needs. One in which you have to deal with various economic needs of other type. And as well, in which one of the, one of the key challenges isn't just about implementing new technologies and moving to a green economy and all those other things, but also just resilience and adaptability, right? Acknowledging that you're going to have to deal with the with the salient consequences as well as try to forestall worse versions of things. And that all all of that part of the narrative I think is is very much in line with my understanding of what climate activists and climate scientists are telling us is necessary. On top of that, again, very much like terraforming on Mars, there's a whole bunch of interesting scientific things that you get exposed to over the course of the deck. Now, one of the criticisms that I've heard leveled by a specifically a climate activist, for what it's worth, of the way Daybreak models this, and this was more like a, a, a fly in the ointment rather than a serious problem, to use a very antiquated idiom, was that by virtue of the design needs of having to have all these cards, it, it, it kind of gives them all a false equivalence. Like, for example, there is a card to make residences, for example, carbon neutral, right? This is a thing that we need to do a lot of. This is a big deal, and it's a huge challenge, and it's, we need to do a lot of that. There's also a card that lets you make the clouds whiter which is a speculative technology which may or may not work, and even if it did work, we could only do it in some places, and it would only have a minor effect. Now, that's fine. I'm not saying it shouldn't be in the game. I'm just saying that in terms of the overall picture one gets, where you've got a sea of cards and both of these are just a single card, eh, you might get a little bit of a lopsided vision. It's just weird and a little bit funny. Now, that, that having been said, the no pun intended silver lining to this is that card about cloud whitening came up, and we all looked it up because every card has a QR code where you can scan it and you get like three or four paragraphs explaining what the thing is. I don't know how accurate any of this is. I'm just an ignoramus who shouts into a can for a living. But it, I, I learned a fair bit just from looking up a half dozen cards or so. And on top of that, there's a full rules reference for how every card works. So it's very well implemented in that sense. It's an impressive product. I had a great time playing it. Looking forward to playing it some more. Yeah, I love it how you can turn on a dime. You have five like core slots for actions, and you can just plop a card down on the top of it. And suddenly that whole action slot changes. You keep all the tags, and you can like manipulate your whole tableau on the turn of a dime and 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 steer it towards like either you've accomplished this part and now you want to start doing something else or a crisis has come up and you need to, you know, do something about that now. It's also got a pretty good arc. If you manage your tableau well, your actions get progressively more powerful, but things get real bad. <laughs> You're getting punched in the face super hard and you have to make sure that your actions are super efficient to deal with it. Now we, we, we found the game uh, by near the end of it a little too easy, despite these challenges that we we're facing. I don't know if this is going to be like the Spirit Island problem, or issue rather, where the game is too easy, but it fools you into thinking you're in danger. If so, that there could be worse problems to have than being like Spirit Island in terms of the difficulty curve. There are ways to make it harder. More experience will teach us whether or not we need to do that. That is Daybreak by Matt Leacock, designer of Pandemic, in case we didn't mention that, and Matteo Menapaze, Designed by CMYK after successful crowdfunding. Walker taught me Arborea. Arborea is designed by Danny Garcia, published by Alley Cat Games. Danny Garcia is the, the designer of Barcelona, which we found blandish as far as your games go. But Arborea, on the other hand, I found very interesting. The way that Arborea works, Walker, I think, very accurately described it as being vaguely reminiscent of Tzolkin in terms of its timing considerations. Because where your workers go, they go on these conveyor belts that progressively go further and further and further as time goes on. And when they get off the conveyor belt, they just shoot down and do a series of actions. And the longer they stay on the conveyor belt, broadly speaking, the more powerful those actions get. There's also an interesting element of coopetition in the economy. If you generate resources, you can do one of two things. You can either spend those resources at the turn you generate them, or you can just not, and then you get a whack of points. And that can be very, very profitable. Now, I'm not sure whether this would break down in larger player count games. We were playing three player, and there it seems okay. But if you're playing a five player game, and you happen to just be downstream of the two people that are reliable generated resources so you get a groundswell of resources and no one else can, that might be problematic. 
In a three-player game, I was actually able to look at people's tableaus of cards that they would use the resources to buy, say, oh, look, no one here needs mushrooms except me. So if I generate mushrooms, I get to score those points, and then next round, when my turn comes around again, they're still going to be there, and I get to use them too. And that made me feel real clever, even though I lost real bad. That element I thought was really well done. The worker placement is novel as how these conveyor belts work. The resource generation is interesting. The overall economy fluctuates in re relatively dynamic ways. I was very, very impressed by Arborea, and I'm very much looking forward to trying it again. Yeah, and the monsters work the same way. Anyone can sort of populate the board with the monsters, and then someone takes them away to their home, and then you design this little ecosystem for them, and you place them in and score points that way. I enjoyed my plane looking very forward to the next one. And lastly, I think for us is Nucleum. This is designed by Simone Luciani and David Surtse and put out by Board and Dice. And it does have a brass feel to it. 100%. Yeah, I think the best way to describe it is it is brass meets barrage. Yeah, so on your turn, you have this hand of tiles. And you're either placing them in your board and doing both of the actions in your personal tableau, or you're placing them on the board and you're hopefully matching as rails, connecting cities together, as long as you have a meeple to put on it. And hopefully you're matching <laughs> and they're, they're color coded on both sides and hopefully you're matching both those sides and you'll still get both those actions. And on top of that, the tiles that they match to, you'll, that person that owns that tile, which also could be you, will get that action as well lot more going on than that. The key tension that I thought was novel in Nucleum and didn't make it feel like a rehash of, of other very successful designs, admittedly, was that tension of the fact that you have these action tiles and the only way to build rail to expand your network, which you desperately need to do, you cannot score anything unless it's in network. You cannot power anything unless it's in network. You cannot satisfy contracts unless they're in network. There are, only a, there are some contracts that don't rely on your network, but they're honestly the minority. To do that, you need to put out these tiles, and you lose them forever, and that feels terrible, because you need to be able to do all of the actions most of the time. Near the e very end of the game, when I built all my, for example, turbines, yeah, I could get rid of the action that lets you build turbines, fine. But that's not going to be the majority of the game state in Nucleum. Most of the time, you can end up putting yourself not into an insuperable corner. You can get out, because you do have a wild action tile that you are not allowed to use as rail. So there's, there's, a, there's a safety valve, but... You can end up in serious problems where you end up with these inefficiencies, but you can't wait because the real estate for building rail links is super valuable and you cannot afford to be cut off. That is another way in which it's reminiscent of Barrage, the, the, the threat of being cut off. And I really enjoyed it. Now, I do think that it's a lot more broke than it needs to be. I wasn't a huge fan of the actual way that the, the majority of points you're going to get are from a variety of, of very outlandish kinds of contract conditions that are all over the map, combined with a variety of buildings that you power just because. You know, one of the things, I've said this a million times, I like about Barrage is that it's fundamentally relatively clean. You're building buildings and you're generating power. And the buildings you're building, maybe you're going to get a lot of your points from building those, but the buildings are still related to power generation anyway. Nucleum is a lot less clean, which is hardly surprising. David Turtse is not known for his minimalism. But nonetheless, I think it comes together in a reasonably good way, primarily by virtue of the tension of the shared board. And again, that's the level of interaction that you often don't see in these management euros. But I was very pleased with that, with th those elements. I was very happy to retread some of the same elements. Power generation in Nucleum allows you to flip over buildings, which is kind of sort of how contracts worked in Barrage, but not quite. And what that does is give you these achievement tokens. And what happens is when you do a reset, when you get all your action tiles back, at least the ones you haven't permanently socked away at the board at great pain, you cash in all your achievement tokens. And so that determines how, how far you get to go up this competitive track. Mostly you do that for end game scoring conditions, which are again, a little bit more Baroque and a little bit more far flung and a little bit more point salady than I would have necessarily liked. But it did have this tension of, of, of trying to 
have this resource that you couldn't just store up and stockpile for the entirety of the game that I found enjoyable. Yeah, and then at that same time, when you're taking that rest action and getting your action tokens back, you're also generating income. There's all these actions that you go up this track, but it also has the interesting sort of mechanism is that you're only going to receive as many as much as that income as action slots you've used along the top of your board. Right. So you can't just keep cycling this victory point track thing over and over again because you do have to take a bunch of actions in order to like sort of make that whole block run. Yeah, otherwise it would be abusive. We, yeah. Near the end of the game, a number of people were were getting like 20 points maximally from their action track. And otherwise, that would just make it so that you were primarily incentivized to pass every round, which would be silly. So I... Uh, you are basically encouraged to play out almost all your action tiles every time, which is fine. Uh, again, the central tension that I found enjoyable in Nucleum was not so much about the actual point scoring, but more about the competition on the board prompted by a paucity of building spots, both for buildings and, more importantly, for rails. That I thought was extremely well done. Very, very tense, agonizing trade-offs the entire time. Uh, I don't think it's going to have the same legs or appeal to me as Barrage does. I can definitely see the lineage. But I do prefer it over Brass, for what it's worth, and I would happily play again. The actual actions you're doing are very clean, and so it's it's a pretty easy entryway in that sense. The yeah. rulebook does a great job of making it seem more complicated than the game actually is, though. It's one of those. That is Nucleum, designed by Simone Luciani and David Turze, published by Board and Dice. It was a good week for, for heavy Euros this it's week, true. I gotta say. After Voidfall, I thought we'd used up all our good heavy Euro energy, but uh, there's, there's still a fair... Well, none of these were really heavy. They were more medium, but... Nonetheless, those are the games we played over the course of the past two weeks. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Mark, we tried NO 1800. It was pretty good. It is going to get an expansion. NO 1801? No. Oh. It's NO 18 die. It's Anyway, it's German for <laughs> it's German for extension. That's all it is. It's, oh, okay. It's, it's just fun to say German words. Um, sure. Yeah, so... Many many German people find that mysterious, by the way. Expansion for Anno 1800. Also, if you didn't get a chance to get a copy of That's Not a Hat, they're going to come out with a new version, more pulp, pop culture version. So now that it's sold out, there will be more copies of That's Not a Hat. A more pop culture version. I, I, look, Mark, this is what it says. Is, I don't I don't make this. That may ad. be a mistake. I would find it, I think, easier to remember characters and cultural references than just arbitrary household objects. Well, it looks like it's still that basic line art. Okay. But just more up-to-date objects. I, I don't know. Up-to-date? I, I don't know. Staplers are cutting edge, Walker. It's true. Okay. So there's been some consternation over the inclusion of Albedo into the canon, primarily by virtue of the fact that Albedo is very hard to get for people who live not in Germany. Upon the recommendation of a number of swaggers and to please uh, some commissioners and overlords, I reached out to the designer and publisher of Albedo, Kai Herberts, who is a uh, very charming gentleman, and he pointed out that there's actually a print and play available of Albedo, at least the base game. Now, it's... 13 pages of cards, so it's not exactly a trivial print-and-play endeavor, and it doesn't have any card backs. But nonetheless, if you don't have access to Albedo, and he, he says he may in the future do another Kickstarter for a reprint, but he doesn't really have any plans to do that, other than, he says, every year at Essenspiel, you can get copies from him directly, so for what it's worth. But anyway, URL links to the print-and-play version, as well as the rulebook, will be included in the episode notes, so if you are truly desperate to play Albedo, which is a remarkable blind bidding slash deck building game, you can have that option available to you. And lastly, Mark, have you ever played Prosperity by Reiner Knizia? I have. They are putting it back out again, and you might think, well, why would they? Do? Well, because it needs a zombie edition, Mark. It's oh my goodness. City of the Living, a new edition of the game released as Prosperity. So now it's going to be called City of the Living, and you get to play the zombie version of Prosperity. Are you excited? Despite you... my tremendous enthusiasm for the designs of Reiner Knizia, he, several times, and I'm not blaming him directly, these are publisher decisions very often, several times has had mediocre designs rethemed into zombie mediocre games. Uh, uh... Hooray! <laughs> On that cheery note, that's going to be all she wrote for this episode of So Very Wrong About Games. And by she, I mean our writer, Gibbon. 
Thank you very much for spending some time with us. If you'd like to get in touch, you can find all our contact information on sowronggamescom slash contact. We read everything you send us and we'll get back to you if we can. We hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much. Please do take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>